Hi, I'm Deanna Jo, and welcome to my channel, Responsible Faith. A while ago, someone brought the Tither's Prayer to my attention, and it kept coming up, or at least variations of it. And so I thought we would just take a look at it. And if you're not familiar with what this is, this is a prayer that some congregations will pray or like speak out collectively while they take up the offering or right before. And so some of them will hold their tithe envelope in the air or their money while they say it. Um, some of them don't, but some of them do that when they walk down to the front to put it in the collection basket or bucket. Anyway, this, this prayer's come up multiple times so I just figured we'd take a look at it so I'm gonna read you the prayer and then we'll just go through it line by line and I'll give my thoughts it says I am a tither today I joyfully bring my tithe into the storehouse therefore the enemy is rebuked the curse is broken and I live under an open heaven my whole family is saved and walking with God I have perfect health and abundance walking in divine favor and blessing you pour upon me such a blessing that there's not room enough to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, debts demolished and royalties received. I'm blessed coming in, I'm blessed going out, and all that I do will prosper in Jesus' name. So these collective declarations, they were a bit trendy in Christian subculture a few years ago. And there is the famous one, you know, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have, <laughs> you know. And they do tend to exist a little bit more in um, charismatic and word of faith circles. This tither's prayer was actually sent to me by an ex-UPC person. They used to say it at her church. And I just thought that was weird because I'd never seen anything like that when I was UPC. And then someone from the complete opposite coast <laughs> uh, had mentioned that their church did something similar. And so I thought, okay, this is a thing. Maybe I need to address this. So I am going to go through this line by line and give my commentary on how unbiblical and misleading I feel that this prayer actually is. So you might ask, well, what's the big deal? I mean, who even cares? Well, I do. <laughs> and herein lies the problem. So you might have a big congregation full of tithe payers, and they'll recite this prayer together every Sunday before they take up the collection. On the one hand, you have some wealthy Christians, and they probably would have prospered whether they were believers or not. For various reasons, you know, maybe they got a good education, they've enjoyed good health, had a good upbringing, you know, various aspects of privilege. And so they will feel accomplished in their faith because they're making it work, they're doing the right things, and they're walking in the blessing as a result. You know, and they will feel that God is smiling on them and everything they do because, well, he must be. Um, they're prospering. On the flip side of that, you will have other Christians in that same church who struggle financially, you know, again, for various reasons, lack of lack of opportunity, lack of education. Maybe they had a rotten upbringing they're trying to recover from. Um, not everybody enjoys good health. And so they will not prosper and they will feel defeated. And, you know, they'll wonder what's wrong with them and what they're doing wrong. Maybe they're not given enough. And they will walk through their life feeling like God is displeased with them and that they're doing something wrong. And really, the only thing wrong is that they're listening to false teaching about these things. And so I just don't want to see good people feeling that God is displeased with them when he's not. So the first line of the prayer says, I am a tither. Well good for you. <laughs> That's your choice. But it's not a requirement. Tithing is not the biblical economy of the Christian community. It was the economy of the nation of Israel. You know, the Levitical tithe seems to be the one they all point to, and the Levitical priesthood has been done away with if you read Hebrews chapter 7. And Jesus Christ is our high priest after the order of Melchizedek, not the tribe of Levi. Christians never tithe in scripture. 
They, we were never told to, nor was it ever modeled anywhere for us. Our economy is one of affordable giving. And I do have a couple of videos where I talk about tithing in scripture and the economy of affordable giving in the New Testament for Christians. And I'll include those links in the description if you're interested. Some might say yes, but Melchizedek received a tithe from Abraham, and that was before the Mosaic Law and before the Levitical priesthood. Well, sort of. Uh, I guess if you consider the fact that the word tithe means a tenth, then yeah. Um, there is one mention in the Old Testament pre-law where a tenth was given, and it was voluntary in a very unique set of circumstances. So, if you want to point back to Genesis 14 as the precedent for tithing, then I guess if I ever go off to war and I win, <laughs> and I recover plunder that belongs to someone else and decide to give it back to them, and on my way back, I come across a priest of God and decide that I'm gonna give him a tenth of said plunder, even though it's not really even mine, uh, I may or may not do that as a one-time gift. Who knows? But that is hardly comparable to what church is required today. Now, the second line of the prayer says, Today I joyfully bring my tithe into the storehouse. And again, another trip back under Mosaic Law. You go to Malachi 3.10. That's where they get this line. And you got to keep in mind that the, the entire book of Malachi was in response to Israel breaking the covenant that they made with God. And they were being called out on it. Verse 10 says, bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and thereby put me to the test. Says Yahweh of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down a blessing until there is no more need. This was written to the Israelites. It does not apply to us. We did not make a covenant with Yahweh at Mount Sinai, nor did we agree to any uh, additions to it in the land of Moab. And so, you know, those covenants <clears throat> that included tithing and a whole bunch of other weird stuff are not ours. The Israelite tithe was never money. It was always food, and they actually did use money back then. That wasn't the issue. It was that the tithe was tied to the land, as were the blessings and cursings attached to it. The next line of this prayer says, Therefore the enemy is rebuked. And again, we're back in Malachi chapter 3, verse 11. It's just the next verse. And I'd like to point out that in this verse, the word actually was not enemy. It was devourer. And I suppose replacing it with enemy kind of helps it fit within a modern narrative and makes it easier for us to apply to ourselves. But scripture doesn't actually say the enemy. Some translations say locusts or pests or insects. And the verse says, I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says Yahweh of hosts. Uh, verse 12 says, then all the nations will call you blessed for you will be a land of delight. Again, the tithe was about the land and the devourer, which was rebuked, was likely crop destroying bugs. And if you look up that word devourer, it is the Hebrew word akal, and it means to eat. And, you know, a footnote in my study Bible suggested it was possibly the name for some sort of a crop destroying insect. And that makes sense, you know, since rebuking it would preserve the fruits of the soil and the vine in the field. And so that's the enemy that was rebuked in this promise to the Israelites. The next line in this prayer says, the curse is broken. Well, of course the curse is broken. You know, if you're a believer, your act of tithing didn't do that for you. Jesus Christ did that for you on the cross. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. And he redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles. What was the blessing given to Abraham? I believe that it was that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. It was salvation by faith, justification through faith. That was the blessing. And the verse says that he redeemed us in order that this blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus so that by faith we might receive the promised Holy Spirit. And that is how we receive. And so we're not under any curses of the law. 
the next line of this prayer says, I live under an open heaven. And now this idea of an open heaven is kind of a trend in charismania, and it's based on a few uh, verses out of context. And one of them is Isaiah 64, 1, and I don't know, I'm sorry. I, I mean, I just, I'm not buying it. I've been around long enough to see a lot of these buzzwords and phrases come and go. You're living under the same heaven as the rest of us. Maybe you're just a little more delusional, but life happens. Some days you're the windshield, some days you're the bug. So again, you might ask, okay, well, what's the big deal here? You know, why are you going to be so negative? You know, who's this going to hurt? Um, so what? If we all just make daisy crowns and wear pretty dresses and twirl in the fields and deny reality, you know, won't we be happier? And that mindset reminds me of the Christmas movie, Miracle on 34th Street, where Brian Bedford said to the judge, if this court finds that Mr. Kringle is not who he says he is, and there is no Santa, I ask the court to judge which is worse, a lie that draws a smile or a truth that draws a tear. Now, I love Christmas movies, um, and that's all fine and good. You know, it gives you the warm fuzzies, and it's great for fantasy. But when it comes to our faith, we need to know what Scripture actually says. Wrong ideas that draw a smile are harmful in the long run, even if they do make people happy right now, because they encourage unrealistic expectations um, and they make people believe things about Scripture and about God that aren't true. Life's hard at times, and expectations of abundance and easy living. You know, they can cause a crisis of faith when reality hits you. And trust me, at some point, it will. Nobody's immune. There are going to be difficult things in your life you are going to have to deal with. Um, and these proclamations of an open heaven where the blessings just rain down whenever we need them, they have no solid foundation in scripture, and they almost turn God into a genie in a lamp who will just show up and grant us all our wishes. And that's not how it works. If you've been alive for any length of time, you, you know that's not how things work. And ideas like this amount to a hill of beans when your life's unraveling. And these things can shake people's faith to the core. And they can wonder, well, you know, like if that wasn't true, was anything I was taught true? And while it is good to make sure that the things that you've been taught are true, that's not a good mindset to be in when you're in the middle of a crisis. The next line of the prayer says, my whole family is saved and walking with God. And again, it doesn't work that way. Your family has to decide for themselves whether to place their faith in Christ or not. You can pray for them, and you should, but you can't override their own choices and declare them into faith. People aren't converted that way. It's the gospel that leads to faith in Christ. And trying to call your family into faith is a misunderstanding of Romans 4.17. And, you know, that's where they get the concept of calling those things that be not as though they are. In that verse, it was referring to God calling Abraham the father of many nations, even though he was old, and him and Sarah were both old, and they didn't have any kids yet. And God did that, and he made it happen, because he's God. <laughs> and there's nowhere in that scripture that says that we can do that. The next line of this prayer says, I have perfect health and abundance, walking in divine favor and blessing." So this kind of makes it sound like divine favor and God's blessing looks like perfect health and abundance. If wealth and health are the measure of the blessing of God, then you can say that Hugh Hefner was more blessed by God than most of the tithe payers I know. I mean, he was a successful businessman, a multimillionaire, he enjoyed good health, he died peacefully at home, and was laid to rest in a $75,000 crypt. I don't think anybody would, would say that he was walking in the favor of God when, in the way he lived his life. But let's talk about the disciples and apostles. They were great examples of faith in the early church, and I guarantee they had the favor of God, and look how they lived and died. 
the Christian life holds no promise of being a walk in the park. Um, and I, I knew a guy who was really into the prosperity doctrine. And he talked a lot about walking in divine health, like it was easy, everybody should be doing it. But before he was a Christian, he was always healthy. And then after he became a Christian, he, nothing changed. He remained healthy, except for then he was walking in divine health and it kind of got spiritualized. You know, in contrast, I had placed my faith in Christ as a little girl. And as a teen, I, you know, I, I prayed, I fasted, I tried to do what was right. I tried to live my life in a way that would please God. And I was sick all the time. <laughs> and here this guy, as a teen, he did whatever he wanted and he was as healthy as a horse. <laughs> and so these aren't good measuring sticks for the favor of God and the blessing of God. And of course, you know, if we could turn that around because the word of faith movement is big on financial prosperity and my husband made more money than him. Did that mean we were more favored by God than he was? Or was it just the fact that my husband went to university, um, got an education, and because of his field of study and his line of work, had higher earning potential? I mean, some things are pretty practical. You know, there's a danger in over-spiritualizing things. Life's just life. And sometimes it stinks. It's often unfair. And the challenges we find ourselves facing are not a spiritual barometer. This type of thinking can produce spiritual pride. You know, when things are going really well for you, it can cause you to look at others and look down on others and maybe even say things. And you know, it, it's easy to crush someone who's already bowed low under the weight of hardship with thoughtless words because you've been lucky enough to not have to deal with their particular struggle. Now, can we ask God for favor and blessing? Of course, absolutely. But declaring yourself into perfect health and financial abundance and tithing yourself there, that's not how it works. And I do want to encourage you with this. Um, if things aren't going your way right now, we all are there at some point and it just feels like everything's falling apart. Life is full of seasons. Um, some of them are great, amazing, and some of them are horrible and heartbreaking. And I just want to encourage you that seasons do change and hopefully your season will change soon but that we've all been there and it doesn't mean that God's mad at you. It doesn't mean you've done anything wrong. It just means that you're in one of those difficult seasons in life. And so I hope that in the middle of your struggle, you won't be worried that you're being punished by God for something because that's another byproduct of this mindset. So the next line of this prayer is, you pour upon me such a blessing that there's not room enough to receive it. So we're back in Malachi 3 again. And I mean, that would imply storage for bountiful crops to me, which again, the land. I have noticed in their little trips back to shop around in the Mosaic Covenant, they never try to bring circumcision forward for Christians or a brother's obligation to marry his brother's widow, to produce an heir, or even you know, that rule in Deuteronomy 23 that nobody of illegitimate birth may enter the assembly of the Lord nor their descendants to the 10th generation. Talk about emptying some churches. <laughs> uh, how about stoning rebellious kids? I mean, I've, I don't hear too many preachers talking about that because their household would probably get a little bit smaller just like everyone else's. It's just, they pick and choose. They strategically go back and pick and choose the things they find most beneficial to drag over for us. So now we've reached the Christmas wish list portion of the prayer. You know, this list almost seems like there should be a dear Santa at the beginning of it. And it says, we receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, debts demolished and royalties received. The section of the prayer is a little bit cringeworthy to me. Most of these things come through hard work, not declarations and tithing. Except maybe gifts and surprises, and for that, I don't know, what do you need, cool grandparents? <laughs> um, 
you know, if you have a normal situation, you know, you have your health, you have a decent paying job, and you work hard, and you pay your bills, and you don't waste your money, that will usually take care of you and your family financially. And it is your best shot at receiving the things listed on this wish list. Um, but this portion did kind of hit me in the heart a little bit. It feels hyper-focused on financial gain, you know, through any means possible, any avenue at all. Just if there's a nickel to be had, I want it. And the scripture that came to my mind was 1 John 2, 15 through 17. And it says, do not love the world or the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away, along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever, or lives forever, or has eternal life. And so this hyper-focus on financial gain, I think, can cause believers to get tunnel vision. Uh, with their focus being on earthly success no matter the cost. Instead of recognizing that mindset as being problematic, they kind of spiritualize it. I've often said the prosperity movement is basically just spiritualized greed. Now there's nothing wrong with earthly success. I like nice houses and cars, and I'm a house person actually, I don't really care about cars, but you know, it's nice to have a decent vehicle to drive and pretty clothes and, and jewelry and take your family on nice vacations. These normal things are not problematic within themselves, but it's when they become the focus of our lives. And at some point along the way, we fall in love with these things. That's when things get out of balance and it creates a problem. Like balance is key here. Some churches will take it the other way and just celebrate poverty, teaching that money's evil when, you know, 1 Timothy 6.10 says it's the love of money that's the root of all evil. You know, it's mo not money that's bad, it's the love of it, or it's when it gets out of focus. Another example of ignoring balance in scripture would be the concept of beauty in 1 Peter 3.3. 3. You know, the braided hair, the gold jewelry, or even the expensive clothing were not the problem here. Any more than nice things are in that portion of scripture in 1 John we just read. Again, it's your focus. And interestingly, in 1 Peter 3.3, 3, the mention of expensive clothing, it's the Greek word hymation. And also a variation of that same word is used in 1 Timothy 2.9. But I've heard this passage taken out of context and used to preach that everything listed in these verses is sinful and prohibited. But did you know that the word hymation or costly attire um, is also found elsewhere in scripture? And it was actually the word used for the hem of Jesus' garment when the woman with the issue of blood touched it. It's also the word used for uh, the garment that Jesus wore that the soldiers cast lots for when he was being crucified. So was Jesus wearing something prohibited and sinful? You know, something that Peter and Paul taught against? Or are we misunderstanding the point yet again? And we're missing the forest for the trees. These passages of scripture do get taken out of context by legalistic groups. The point of these passages is this. Our main focus and our love in life should not be outward beauty or money or worldly success. You know, these are all temporary things that on this earth they do have value, but they're passing away. So it's good not to get too caught up in that. And we need to keep the main thing the main thing. Jesus should be the center of our lives. But again, it's okay to be beautiful. It's okay to have money. Goodness knows, it's going to be hard to get through life without any. And it's okay to have worldly success. The, the key here is to find a healthy balance. Now the last line of this prayer says, I'm blessed coming in and I'm blessed going out and all that I do will prosper in Jesus' name. This takes us to Deuteronomy 28 where they were making a covenant. And verse one says, if you faithfully obey the voice of Yahweh your God, being careful to do all his commandments that I command you today. So you're gonna have to read there to read all those commands. Yahweh your God will set you on high above the nations of the earth. And then verse two through five, talk about all the ways they'll be blessed if they obey. You know, blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed in the fruit of their womb and the increase in livestock and it goes on. And verse 6 says, blessed shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. Again, this passage of scripture was not talking about you, and even if it was, I can guarantee you do not faithfully obey all those commands that were commanded in Deuteronomy. 
So that's my breakdown of this specific tithers prayer. I'm sure it can be pretty well applied to other ones too because they all sort of have a similar ring to them. And I think this prayer is misusing scripture and operating outside of the humble and discreet way that Christians are commanded to give in scripture. And I know that this subject of tithing upsets Christians and especially ministers. I've had people get upset with me and say, well, how's the church going to support itself if people don't tithe? I don't know, but I mean, you can't use that as, as proof that mandatory tithing is biblical. You've got to have scripture for that. And I would assume, since affordable giving is the model in, in scripture in the New Testament, that that would work. You know, people will also say, uh, well, all I know is that it worked for me. We've been blessed because we've tithed. Well, great. Again, not a biblical proof of mandatory tithing for Christians. And I'll be honest with you, I find most of the people who say this are not doing any better than anybody else in the secular community of their age and their employment. In fact, a lot of times they're not doing as well. I have been accused of not wanting people to give money to the church by saying this because of course, you know, if you say something like this, people take it to the absolute extreme. And, you know, that's not true either. I have no problem with people giving money to their church. You know, my personal view is if it just stands to reason that if you attend a church, that if you can afford to, you contribute financially because, you know, it takes money to pay the bills. I mean, we all know that. And I don't even have a problem with people who say, you know what, 10% is just a good number. It's easy to keep, you know, to figure out and keep track of, and we can afford it. And so I'm just going to go with that. So technically I'm given a 10th, but I know it's not mandatory. And for that, I say, hey, that's great. You know, I totally get that. I have no problem with that. My problem is when ministers get up and teach that you are going to hell if you don't tithe or that you're going to be under a curse or that God won't bless you or that bad things are going to happen to you. That's where my problem comes in. That's false teaching. I also hate to see people who can't afford to give 10% being manipulated into giving money they can't spare to local churches when in reality a lot of them, especially some of the elderly people, probably should be receiving from the church and not giving to the church. Um, I hear from people who say, you know, I can't afford to do this. And I'm talking like basic necessities, like medical things, um, dental things, medications, you know, but my pastor says I have to tithe. And like, I'll be honest with you, I message those people back and I tell them, you know what, you take care of your health. Um, your pastor will be fine. It actually disgusts me to see some churches exploit elderly people the way they do. Um, some of these people are barely getting by and the church will shake them down for every nickel they can get out of them and they don't care. They, they do not care. Another thing about prayers, reciting prayers like this, is it creates social pressure that is manipulative and it's inappropriate and it's unbiblical. And it sort of feels like extortion. And, and it's also very showy. I mean, you think about people holding up their tithe envelopes and making this chant. Imagine the people who aren't giving because they can't afford to. Imagine how they're feeling in that moment. This entire concept seems an interesting contrast to Matthew chapter 6, which says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets. Sound no trumpet, or chant no chant, or don't wave your money around, or, uh, sorry, I'm just kind of getting off into the Deanna translation. <laughs> sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received the reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. That is my breakdown of this tither's prayer, and so I hope you found it interesting, and if you enjoyed this video, you can hit like. If you didn't, I'm sure you'll hit dislike, 
And if you want YouTube to notify you when I post a new video, you can subscribe to my channel and hit the little notification bell and YouTube will let you know when I put another one out. So have a great day.